Okay, welcome everybody. This is our first cloud native uh, meetup over at uh, Synopsys slash Black Duck. Um, me and Matt Fenwick, I'm Jay. Matt Fenwick is with me. We're hosting. We've got a bunch of other really friendly, lovely, wonderful people here today. Um, so, um, we're hiring, by the way. So, if you guys know anybody, Who's looking for a job? We're looking for Docker Kubernetes people. You have left us. So um, I'm going to go through. So you all got handouts. Um, for those of you go for for everybody else, there's um, we have a wiki page, um, and it is uh, here. It is um, github.com slash black duck software slash offsite slash wiki slash preceptor meetup. I'll put the notes in the wiki in the meetup page later. So we've got a wiki page that just kind of outlines everything here. Me and Matt don't like slides. We think it leads to passive learning, right, Matt? That's right. So, <laughs> so we have a marker board, but I'm going to try to also include, try to keep the digital portrayal of this uh, somewhat up to date by leaving notes on here and whatnot. Before, so we're going to talk about threat modeling. We're going to talk about this product called the Opsite Connector, an open source product called Perceptor is based on. We're going to talk about threat modeling in Kubernetes, which is kind of an interesting thing, um, and just like go through an example, um, talk about the downward API, what happens, how you can compromise secrets, clarify some things about Base64 that I see a lot of people making mistakes with. Um, and then we're going to sort of look into, we're going to look at this little stim simulator thing of mine that just kind of gives you a visual way of estimating and depicting um, the amount of vulnerabilities you have in your cluster at any given time. So um, to start, though, I think we're going to talk about Heptio Sonobuoy, and there's a reason for that. Um, when I came to this company about, um, so the Sonobuoy website is, you know, github.com slash Sonobuoy. When I came here about a year and a half ago, um, I had come from Red Hat, and a good friend of mine, Tim St. Clair, was was on my team. Uh, he was our team lead, and and um, and we all used to work on the Kubernetes end-to-end -end test together. And he went over to Hept.io, and he built this tool called Sonobuoy, which I absolutely love. And what Sonobuoy does is it's a it allows you to give you a baseline for functionality in your cluster. So what does this have to do with security? So, like, I'll just like pose the question to you guys: barriers to adopting security. Does anybody want to throw one out? developers doing things in a secure way? What's the hardest thing about getting a developer to do things in a secure way? They don't like to be told what to do. They don't like to be told what to do. And what else? They want to move fast. They don't have time. They don't, don't, don't have time, right? Yeah. Right. So it's not time. So and, and so why does it cost time? The reason it costs time is because you have no idea when you secure something whether or not you've broken it. So there's a time investment. There's a risk there. There's a risk that nobody talks about in securing your systems, right? So, um, which is that you broke it. Kubernetes clusters are very complicated, right? You're mount, you're doing all sorts of your, you've got NSNers going on. You're, you're, you, you know, every time you talk, you got, you've got it, you're accessing everything through a proxy, and there's a load balancer in front of the proxy, and then there's, you know, you've got a virtual network, and the virtual network sitting on top of a host, and then you've got. Um, You've got, you know, well, not anymore, but you used to have coup proxies running on every node. You've got firewall, IP tables, rules that are being opened up and changed uh, on every node every time you create a new service. There's all sorts of ridiculous, crazy things that people do in Kubernetes clusters. So um, securing a Kubernetes cluster is really, really dangerous, right? Because you have no idea what you're going to break. It's not like you just open up this one port and you're done, or you close a port and you're done. Right, it's a very dynamic environment. So the end-to-end -end tests are a really cool thing. Kubernetes has um, the um, the uh, there's a conformance initiative. Okay, and so anybody that's running a Kubernetes cluster should know about this. Um, there is when you say Kubernetes, there's only one definition of that word, and that is something that passes all the conformance tests. Okay, so there's like I don't know 50, 60, 70 of these. I don't even remember anymore. Um, but the good thing is you don't need to remember anymore because of Sonobuoy. So Sonobuoy takes those conformance tests that you can run against any Kubernetes cluster. So for example, Red Hat, when they ship OpenShift, they run the Kubernetes tests against it. Um, any 
Kubernetes provider would do this. Um, when when you're when you run those tests, they give you these reports. And what Sonobuoy is is it's a tool that allows you to um, sort of like do this and like it's like really easy, right? So you go to and this is also a brilliant way to install a Kubernetes application. So for those of you that are wondering how am I going to ship kube applications to my people, to my customers, um, this is really interesting. So what they do is I go to scanner.heptio.com, okay? And I say scan my cluster, right? And um, as soon as I do that, it creates this thing with a little hash in it, right? Um, where is my hash? It's like, the, yeah, it creates this guy, right? So then I just grab this YAML, okay? And I've got a cluster that I've set up here for this demo. So I copied it, it's on my, it's in my terminal. Go over here, and um, so I can do kubectl get nodes. You can see my cluster, okay. Um, okay, there we go. So I got a, got a big cluster here, right? And um, so, you know, I can do sonobuoy.yaml Two dot yaml, right? Whatever. All right, here we go. Okay, so now I do kubectl create dash f. And when I first did this, this is kind of silly that this is so amazing to me, but I love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I just I just copy the paste, copy pasted the Sonobuoy contents over that they made for me, um, and then we'll walk through the yaml while the test's running. But anyway, so I run this guy. Okay, and it's going to schedule all these pods. Okay, that's okay. Don't worry about the errors at the end. It's just that those role bindings um, already existed before because I've run this before on this cluster. Um, and so once this starts running, um, yeah, see, like I didn't do anything. So it's this is really cool. So as soon as I created all these pods, right? kubectl get ns. Um, as soon as I created all these pods, it created. Um, we created the, the Heptio stuff. It's running now. And it's in the Heptio Sonobuoy namespace, 26 seconds you can see. And what this guy did is it went off and um, updated this web page. So it sent the little token somehow to, to this Heptio's little central nervous system. And then um, they're just going to display all my conformance tests. So like a year and a half, two years ago, like maybe even six, I mean, I don't know how long this the UI for this has been around, but I mean, it used to be you'd have to go grab these things from a Kubernetes binary, run them, parse through the tests yourself. I've had clients do this here um, at the at Black Tuck, and I mean, it takes them weeks to get these tests out because you got to find out whether the cluster's broke or not before they, you know, you don't know whose fault it is when something's broken. And so if you're shipping Kubernetes to people, this is such a powerful tool. The, the E2E test, the conformance movement in general, it's a great upstream thing. Um, to be involved with, um, especially like if you're a network provider, if you're whatever, you know what I mean? You could tell people that, okay, once you put this hardware in, run these conformance tests, send us the results. They give you really granular results. So this is great. This is your baseline. So now when you go and you put some weird software security library um, on your cluster, you can very easily confirm that your cluster works properly by running these tests. And you'll see them later on. I'll show them to you guys. So... Um, what, whatever the results are on this, this is a GKE cluster. Um, so let's move over to um, like. So this is just verifying the conformance of your cluster to the Kubernetes specification, right? Because ultimately, Kubernetes is what? It's an API, right? It's just an API. I mean, at the end of the day, it defines an API, it defines how these components interact with each other. And it defines a canonical implementation of that, right? You can swap the storage out, swap the um, VXLAN out, swap the container runtime out. When you change those things, does it still work? That's what the conformance tests tell you. And there's hundreds of end-to-end -end tests in Kubernetes. The conformance test is an artisanally crafted like subset of them. So um, yeah, so I like this. Um, anyways, so now like once you know that your cluster, whether it works or not, now we can start talking about why, why you want to know whether it's secure, how, how, what a threat model is for Kubernetes cluster. So I'm not a threat modeling expert. I'm not a security expert. Um, so um, what we're going to go through is just like one or two examples of like when we talk about a model for a threat model for Kubernetes, what, 
what we're really what we're interested in. Um, so there's a few different ways you could compromise a Kubernetes cluster, right? So um, you can have a malicious person on the outside, right? So you could have somebody on the outside who's um, who's coming in from the ex from the outside and who is going to break into your API server, break into etcd. Uh, are we all familiar with the basic architecture of Kubernetes here? Roughly, yeah, etcd, API server, controller manager, all that. Yeah, so they can get into etcd. If they get into etcd, they can steal static information. They can steal security information. They can know what containers you're running, stuff like that. Um, there's um, malicious containers. You know, you could actually have a container that was intentionally built to... Um, to do something bad, right? Exfiltrate. Exfiltrate? Is that a word? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, exfiltrate. Yeah, you're right. Um, Etsy. Just to run Bitcoin mining. Yeah, somebody could Bitcoin it, right? Um, so that's where the Istio stuff gets interesting, right? Um, because some stuff you can't necessarily figure out from the inside, but you could figure it out from the outside, looking at who's talking to who and how often. Um, so um, there's the whole... Compromising container is the most interesting one to us here because um, of what we work on. But like, you know, you may have vulnerabilities in the code that's running in your cluster. And if there's a way to exploit that, you could be in big trouble, right? Um, and so so why? Why would you be in big trouble? Why is, it, why is it maybe even more dangerous in some ways, depending on how you look at things, than being in a VM, right? So Kubernetes unifies everything, right? You're running all your applications now in the, the same place in the same virtual place at least. So um, as an example, how, you guys, everybody's familiar with the whole struts thing, right? So you know, you, you could put a token into a header and then you can get into a container, get into a cluster and start doing stuff, get into a VM and start doing stuff. You do the same thing at the container level. But in a Kubernetes cluster, it's kind of interesting because once you get into a container, you can start fishing around for stuff, right? You can look for secrets. You can look for environment variables, right? So, um, so as you guys know, you know, um, if I go into one of my cluster, one of my con containers, kubectl get pods dash n. Here's one, right? If I do kubectl, you know, uh, exec dash t dash i. CFSSL dash n, right? And I, slash bin, slash sh. Oh, wait, this isn't in my window. Sorry. Okay. I make my window. Can you guys see my font now better? Yeah. Okay, so now if I do an env, right? As you guys know, most of you guys probably know this, but there's all sorts of wonderful stuff that Kubernetes just injects into the environment variables of a Kubernetes, uh, any, any, contain, any, any container that's running, right? It's going to give you all your service names, all their IPs, ports that things are running on, whatnot. Um, and it kind of gets better than that, too, right? Because if I, I'll ask the question. If I do a mount, right? Um, you can see that Kubernetes is mounting, mounting all sorts of stuff in here, right? It's mounting stuff from the host. It's mounting stuff from slash proc. It's mounting um, your, uh, let's see, I'm looking for my, well, yeah, it's got that. It's got, in this one, I don't have any volumes uh, loaded, but um, I'll go to one that does. Um, so, uh Oh yeah, no, I do. I'm sorry. Yeah, I've got so I've got my resolve.conf. I've got my um, my Etsy host name. I've got all that mounted in here, right? So I can get um, I can get it I can get it all this metadata um, that's kind of already sitting around in my cluster. I can get at that from inside the inside of my inside of my container, right? So um, in addition to that, uh, in Kubernetes, you can also there's there's also this concept of secrets, right? So if I go on a given cluster, kubectl get secrets, dash dash all namespaces, right? I may have lots and lots of secrets floating around, right? And so as soon as I have all these, a lot of these get injected, right? These service accounts, right? These get injected into your Kubernetes cluster, and they're and now they're now now those can 
possibly get access when you're, once you're inside of a container. Um, and has anybody used the downward API for Kubernetes? Yeah? Okay. So as you know, with the downward API, right, um, if somebody's mounting metadata about the host into the cluster, right, you get into one of the containers, now you can see where your host is. Um, if you can see where the host is, you could start fishing around there and start doing strange things, right? So um, the downward API is another really cool thing. You can get um, just a, a list of stuff you can do with it. Um, you know, you get your node name, your host IP, you can get your pods IP in there, you can get labels about things, you can get service account names, all sorts of other stuff. So you could see how a hacker person, I'm not a hacker person, but you could see how a hacker person could start to reverse engineer a pretty thorough model of how your Kubernetes, Kubernetes cluster might be architected if they can get into a few containers. Okay. Um, and so um, also note that you can, you can access services that aren't exposed, right? So for example, um, if I do kubectl get nodes, um, right? This is a GKE cluster. Um, <clears throat> and I do kubectl kubectl get services, all namespaces, right? Okay, so like I can see, you know, um, there's stuff on here like this, 305A2, right? So that port, uh, right there, right? If I go ahead and get nodes again, right, I can curl that guy, right? So there's a port here. I may have not thought that I exposed it, but, whoa, what did I just do? Yeah, here we go. So, yeah, I can go. Oh, I have to be in my Kubernetes cluster to do this. So, um, let's see. If I go in here and I go to oops. if I go in here, I get in here, and then I uh, attach dash tk, right? Um, Right. I can go and I can curl stuff, right? And I can curl stuff through endpoints that I didn't really think I was exposing, right? Through ports that I didn't know I was exposing, right? So not everything is going to just go through your load balancer once you start exposing things, node ports and stuff. Um, so it's pretty dangerous, right? Okay, so um, so that's kind of that's how you model a th model threats in a Kubernetes cluster, right? You got to think about all the resources that can be made available to you once you enter into a container or once you compromise um, the infrastructure components that are there, right? Um, and uh, maybe later on, this, these Heptio tests will finish running. They can take a long time. Um, but um, just quickly, I'll go through some of them, and then I'm going to show my little modeling thing, and then uh, Matt's going to go. Um, so, so where's my thing? Um, Where's our perceptor? Yeah, this one. Okay, so just I'll just walk you through now going back to the test we were running. Some of the tests that, you know, after looking at all that stuff that you may want to lock down and be careful about, the beautiful thing is here, you run your conformance tests, you'll know if you lock things down too much, right? Um, SIG apps, replication controls should serve a basic image on each replica with a public image. So this is going to tell you if you can run your basic simple Docker containers, right? Um, empty deer. This is another huge one. Okay, I've seen this so many times on customer sites, right? They've got so much security they can't mount volumes. We've seen customers that can't mount empty deer. Like this actually happens in production <laughs> clusters, right? So um, you know, making sure that if you mount base baseline temporary storage for a container, you can read from it. Right? That's a node conformance test. The node folks have worked really hard to make sure that there's a great set of just, you know, tests for the nodes themselves in a Kubernetes cluster. Um, making sure proxies work. Making sure that config maps, once they're mounted into volumes, are readable, right? Conformance tests will give you all of this. And uh, if something fails, they'll tell you. Then you can go fix it. Or you can ask your vendor to check to fix it. For the NFV people here, right? Network granular checks, making sure that every pod can talk to every other pod, right? That's super important. 
uh, there's things like hairpin mode where uh, some some places you'll, you'll find that two pods that are on the same NIC won't be able to talk to each other for some reason, but they can talk to pods on another NIC, right? And then so, you know, you get weird situations where you got a four-node cluster and a quarter of the time stuff isn't working, right? Because a quarter of the time things just happen to be in the same place. Um, and so, uh, so, yeah, that's what the conformance tests give you. So, um, okay, so now that you know that you can confirm that you didn't break your cluster by securing it, how do you secure it, right? And so, um, so we have a, a product called the Opsite Connector, which Matt's going to talk about. It's based on an open source project called Perceptor, um, wh which gives you kind of a global view of all the, all the containers that are running using our Black Duck Hub um, to scan them uh, in terms of all the vulnerabilities that exist there. Um, and uh, so I should probably show a screenshot of the hub, what it gives you. Um, it's just called Black Duck. Right? It's called Black Duck, thanks, Jeff. <laughs> so I can go to a hub. Here's one. 35. We have all these. Let's see if any of these hubs exist anywhere. Um, SAS, there we go. So I can just go to a hub. Um, and go, go to this hub right here. Okay, um, and I can go in here. Okay, and I could log in, right? And once I can log in, I can see all the vulnerabilities in my cluster at any given time. So this is what Matt will tell you more about how we do this and offsite and whatnot. But it'll basically scan everything in your cluster, continuously update them, and add annotations to containers. So when we talk about scanning everything in a cluster, um, you know, what do we mean, and and what does that actually what does that actually look like? So we have this tool to to help. You know, when we talk to customers about this, they don't always fully understand what we mean when we say we're scanning everything in your cluster and how important it is to do that. So we have this new tool that's that's out here. It's called Vulnsim, and you can use this to simulate any sort of environment, any sort of actions that are going on in a Kubernetes cluster. And what it does is it generates like synthetic of events from like a normal distribution assuming that a third of all containers have a vulnerability in them and it adds and deletes pods from namespaces and it generates namespaces and it puts a you know normally distributed one to ten containers in a namespace and those containers are selected from a distribution of containers where the majority of containers come from the same place because that's how docker out is right a lot of images have a hundred million pulls and then a lot of images have one pull Right, and they're not just an, people don't just randomly run Docker images. They run them according to a distribution, which means that in the long tail, it could be a very long time until you actually see all the containers that might run in your cluster. Okay, so let's see if this works. Um, so it looks something like this once you start um, visualizing this. So this is a thing called Term UI. It's a terminal GUI thing. It's like this really nerdy way of building user interfaces uh, in Go. Um, and so what we do is we run this simulator, it generates, you know, thousands and thousands of events and it simulates a situation where you have, you know, like, um, you know, 100 users and users, you know, have a 90% probability every, you know, you know, every minute of changing something uh, in the cluster, either deleting or adding an app. And then so what you get when you actually start and then it simulates you actually trying to scan all this and this is what your life looks like, right? You start scanning it on day one, you only have 400 vulnerabilities. Then you have 8,000. This number keeps going up, right? And then eventually, these are the amount of vulnerabilities you have that you don't know about yet, right? And eventually, that number starts to go down and it tails off, right? But it can take a long time for you to sample all the images in your cluster and see everything, right? And if you actually run this um, in, a, in a larger scale scenario, which we've kind of pre-done for you, cooking show style, you can do experiments like this, and it gets kind of scary because if you look at the top, it looks like you get rid of all your vulnerabilities, but over a time, again, because you're sampling from a distribution that's kind of complicated, you know, you can get 14 vulnerabilities pop up long after you thought you got rid of all of them, right? And um, so having higher, higher, n higher throughput of scanning, um, being able to scan hundreds of containers in a day, is super important if you want to really secure your cluster production data center. You may have 2,000 or 3,000 containers running at a time, and those are going to rev 
every week, every two weeks. So this is a continuous thing you have to be vigilant about. Um, so that's that. It's called VulnSim. You can play with it to generate different kinds of profiles of events that happen in a cluster, simulate different... Uh, image, or are you um, the running container? You scan the image. So the Matt will actually talk about that with Receptor now. Um, that's pretty much, I think... But that's a good question. Matt's going to go through that. Can you get started? Yeah, I think so. I need to look at my thing and make sure I talked about everything. Yeah, that's it. It's your turn. Um, and I, I just want to see if the Heptio thing came through. Um, I'm going to the slides on your computer. Okay, yeah. Because it's just not going to work on the library. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pull up the slides. That's fine. Um, so, okay, hopefully at the end of the talk, we'll be able to see the conformance test. Now Matt's going to talk about the solution of this problem. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, let's see. Whoa, where did your window go? Um, Does anybody have any questions while we wait? I tried running the conformance test on PKS. No, um, but this is one of the reasons I actually started running Sonobly, so that's actually <coughs> I'm sure they'll fail from what we've seen so far. Yeah, I'm sure they'll fail. Um, there are lots of mutations, DNS, that's all covered. Um, I'd like to run them straight up against the address. Azure is certified. Uh, Azure is certified. Google certified. Azure is certified. Last I checked, Amazon was not. Yeah? Yeah, that's interesting. Okay. Last I checked for my <coughs> I'm not talking smack about Amazon on behalf of the slightest competitor. I'm okay. just saying verify it. <laughs> okay. Do we have any other questions about the J stuff? Yeah. All right. cool. So I, I wanted to give you all a chalk talk because I really like drawing on the board and stuff, but it's just too hard to read. So I'm just going to kind of show you some slides from the talk that I gave recently. Um, and it's kind of like, yeah. So feel free to interrupt me with questions and stuff like that if I'm not explaining stuff. Um, okay, so Opsite, which Jay was just talking about, the idea behind Opsite is that we help you to keep your cluster secure. The way that we currently do that is we scan all the images that we can find running in your cluster. And then we scan those using Black Duck or the Hub or whatever it's called. And based on the stuff that Black Duck finds in there, we report vulnerabilities. So we only look at the static images, you know, back to your question. We don't look at the containers themselves. So if you have something going on in your container, like vulnerable files get created after the container starts running, we're not going to see something like that because we're just looking at static images. If you're running Bitcoin or something like that, we may or may not be able to actually notice that because, you know, we're looking at the static images. If you have other exploits in there, like buffer overruns and things, we're not going to see that kind of stuff. But what Black Duck does is it looks at the files that it sees in an image, and it matches that to some KB, and then it tells you, oh, okay, you have several open source components. So like if it finds evidence of Apache struts or something in the image, then it re would report that to you in the results and say, there's a good chance you have vulnerabilities coming from, say, Apache struts or something like that. We're not really too concerned with that on the Opsite side. We really look more at the cloud native part, which is you install Opsite in a cluster, and then we'll find all the images and scan them for you and give you the scan results. So the way that Opsite works is um, you have several pods, and those have different responsibilities on going to those. Uh, if you're not familiar with a pod in Kubernetes, it's how you can group containers into a single logical unit. And kind of everything in Kubernetes is based on that concept of pods. So whenever you want to run a program, you spin up a pod that has one or more containers in it. Obviously, a container is a running image. So we have three basic pods for Opsite. The first one is Perceptor, and uh, that's a Transformers name. I don't know if anybody here likes Transformers, but Perceptor was the guy who diagnosed the death of Optimus Prime in the 1986 movie. And Perceptor is the model. You know, it's like the brain, it's the heart, it's the memory, it's all that kind of stuff for Opsite. It makes all the decisions. It stores our data, it does all the hard stuff. Then we have Perceiver, and Perceivers are different components that are platform specific. So when we run on Kubernetes, we have what we call a pod Perceiver. When we run on OpenShift, we 
also use the Kubernetes perceiver, but then we run an additional one called image perceiver. And those things are responsible for actually finding what's running. So perceiver can talk to the Kubernetes API server, and it can get a list of all the pods that are currently running in Kubernetes. Set up a watch, and whenever a new pod gets scheduled, the perceiver will see that. And then it will dig through the information that the Kubernetes API server gives us and actually find the Docker images that are being run by those pods. Same thing for the OpenShift perceiver, except that deals with image streams, which are concepts that aren't really present in Kubernetes. Uh, I don't really know a whole lot about image streams, but the important thing for the perceivers is they're supposed to find what's running so that we know what we actually have to scan with Black Duck. You could think of running a perceiver on something like Docker Compose or Docker Swarm. It might be a lot simpler than Kubernetes or OpenShift. As long as it finds everything that's running, then you're good. Um, so that's the first two pods that we have. We have the perceivers to talk to the platform, Perceptor to be the heart and soul and brains and all kind of stuff. And then we have our unit, uh, our, our last pod is for scanning. And it actually runs a Java program that scans the Docker image and up, it uploads all those results to the Black Duck Hub. Uh, so the first thing it needs to do is it needs to be able to get a tar file of a Docker image. And the way that it does that is it uses a container that we call image facade. It talks to the Docker daemon and basically does like a Docker save to get a tar file. And then the second thing is it runs our Java scanner against that tar file. And uh, the reason we have it split up into two containers is because, like, unfortunately, to talk to Docker, you need to have a root access for your container. And that's kind of, you know, like, it's definitely a, um, a place that could be exploited. You know, you have a container that has root access, that a lot of bad things can happen there. So by splitting the separate container, we can replace that with a, another implementation of the image facade that maybe doesn't require root access. So we played around with that a little bit. All right, I'm just kind of giving you guys a monologue. I don't want to bore anybody here. Um, can you please interrupt me with some questions or something like that? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, awesome. so, uh, so that image facade thing you were talking yeah. about to, to kind of control root access for the container? Yeah. I wasn't sure about like where what the final disposition of that is. So I understand there's a security vulnerability if a container needs access to the to the root daemon. I mean the daemon running on the sir on the node. Right. How did you how did you actually secure that relationship? Well, the how do we secure that relationship? I mean, the, the real problem is if you have a container get compromised, it's not it's obviously not great, but it's also not necessarily the end of the world. But if you have a root, if you have a container with root privileges get compromised, then it's really bad. Oh, but you still have a root right. container there. The image facade is root. Right. So exactly. instead of having one container with root, you have one which isn't and one which right. is. So exactly. it's still the same. Yeah. So the so difference, what's the, what's the difference there? there is that this is something that can be swapped out. So if you're comfortable with running a container that has root privileges, you just use the default image facade. If you're not, then you can run something else there. There's a really simple interface for that to implement. And so it's a trade-off. You know, we can't say one or the other is better. The advantage of doing the default one is that it's very easy for it to get up and running. The right, disadvantage right, right. is convenient and not secure. The disadvantage is if you don't talk to Docker, you need some other way to get images. Right. So what is the other what is the other way? Well, there's lots of other ways. One way is it could just copy files from somewhere else. Like you could have the static files somewhere. You could have some Docker registry somewhere else that it talks to. Um, yeah, we have actually a separate, like, just we did it for a hack day, right. image facade implementation that does containers, but, you know, the majority of the content is already in the image, and most people don't even scan that. So it's just, it's just a matter of getting started, right? I mean, scanning the image is going to give you tons of vulnerabilities that you probably didn't even know you had running. And whatever's in your container is maybe possibly going to give you more vulnerabilities, but trust me, I mean, if you're like anybody else out there, you've got plenty of vulnerabilities in your images. You know, if you're just running, just run the JVM. You know what I mean? You've got plenty of stuff right, right. to look at. Any, pick anything on Maven Central, you know, and, and that'll keep your hands full for a few months just fixing that stuff. Yeah. But, but yeah, we've got alternate image facade implementations. Um, and and that, that's a great question. And, you know, like, that's why... 
what I really like about Perceptor is that that's the open source upstream thing. So it's more of a toolkit. You know, we have implementations for all these different containers, but we would be more than happy to work with people to, you know, if you don't want an image facade, we would help you build one. If you don't want a privileged one, we would help you build a different implementation or something like that. We just don't have a canonical one that's not privileged, you know, or canonical one requires privilege access. Yeah. Something else. It, it really depends on what exactly the customer setup is, you know. And we don't necessarily have an answer for that. So, uh, trying to understand that. Yeah. So, uh, this whole thing is with your product, and um, this is not running inside the Kubernetes. Can run inside the Kubernetes, it can run anywhere, right? So, on the left is the Kubernetes. You need just access to the Kubernetes API, and you need a way to pull images from a Docker registry where uh, the Kubernetes is uh, pulling it from. Yeah. That's all you need. Yeah, yeah, I think that's fair to say. And um, I do not understand the root access. Uh, so this is this is inside your product implementation. Yeah, uh, and what is the it's it's kind of like a Docker and Docker sort of thing. So it talks to the Docker daemon that's running on that actual node, and so in order to do that, you have to give it privileged access. Otherwise, you can't talk to Docker. Yeah, but that's your product, right? So what is the big thing? Uh, this 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 that box is you can run it. Oh yeah, or, um, or anywhere, right? Yeah, server. yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a fair point. Um, it's just it's easy if you just run it yeah. on the Kubernetes cluster because then you don't have to have other machines somewhere else that are running it or something. So yeah, you could do that. Um, you know, the other part of this is that these scans are really expensive, and so you can run five or ten of these scan containers all at the same time, and, and suddenly that's too much for a laptop to handle or something like that. You know. But yeah, like in principle you can. That's a great point because almost all the code we write is Golang. Yeah. It's really easy to package yeah, up. So what I'm saying is this, this that uh, uh, box that um, has to be, can run in its own cloud, cloud or yes. anywhere. Yeah, yeah, and definitely. As long as that, uh, inside that it's compromised, uh, it just has to have access to the Kubernetes API server to find out all the things right. that are running. And right. find out the image file name, right. and you need to access you need access to the Docker registry to pull the images, and right. then you are doing the scanning in this in that box. Right. Yeah. So that's a great point, and you know, like, so this is a new product for us, and we're kind of still exploring yes. the ways that it could be built and other uses and applications and stuff like that. So if somebody came along and had requirements like that, and they said, "Okay, I have this place where I want to run it," you know, like we'd be happy to to work with people to to you know try and change things around and get it to work for that use case. It's just not one that we run into yet. Yeah. But yeah, it's a great point. Ed, yeah, do you have another question? Yeah, it's just getting a little muddy about where the uh, images that you're scanning are coming from. So are they coming from right. the registry, or are they coming from the Docker daemon cache? Yeah. Or both? Or yeah, that's, when? that's another great question. So when we use a perceiver to talk to the Kube API server, right. you'll see an image that's like, you know, docker.io slash I don't know, MySQL, colon sure. latest. So what we get from that is we get the, you know, the registry, and then we get the SHA. Right. So we use that information to pull the image, and we use the Docker daemon to do the actual pulling of the image. So it may or may not be in the Docker daemon on that node, and if it's not, the first thing we do is we have the Docker daemon pull it in. The second thing we have it do is do basically a save so that it gets exported as a tar file. So wherever it ultimately comes from is whatever is in that Docker tag. It could come from the internal registry. It could also come from Docker Hub or any other publicly exposed you know, Docker registry. It could just come oh. from the node itself. And not be exactly. It could come from the node itself if it's already there. Right. Yeah. That's another reason why running in the cluster is a nice thing. Because <clears throat> some of the images at least will already be there. And it's well, they might not even be anywhere else. Right? So yeah. If I, mean, I build I mean, something yeah. locally, it's only in exactly. my cluster. Mm -hmm. Right, it hasn't been exported into a visible registry, mm -hmm. or it has, and you just haven't, and you just don't want to spend the time figuring out how to tell us to talk to that registry. Right, but I mean, it may not even be in an external registry at all. Yeah. Right. So you have to. Well, then it'd be hard. But right. then this, then it wouldn't be able to run. Yeah. But yeah, no, so it won't be able to run. You, you, you yeah, if you bake it into the node, I guess. Docker. Uh, Sorry, you use Kubernetes doesn't have an internal an integrated that's registry. That's that's registry. So OpenShift does. That's yeah. what we'll get. I yeah. think. Okay. Sorry, Sorry, was that? No. 
you, you need Docker to pull the image uh, right. from a registry, right. either from Docker Hub or a private registry anywhere. Right. There is a container called Bin. Uh, are you familiar with the Docker inside Docker? Uh, yeah. So yeah. you can run, um, instead of using the force Docker, you can run Bin uh, image and right. use that Docker yeah, so anywhere. we talked about this idea, and I can't remember why we ended so, up going with a different approach. The thing with DIND, though, is you still, you can't get away from needing access. Yeah, you need, you need the credential, or essentially the uh, tokens or whatever, yeah. uh, to be pushed, and then, then you can pull it from any private registry, as long as you have the uh, certificate for the private registry inside that container. Didn't the Docker inside the Docker can actually pull it uh, from that private registry or from the Docker hub? Yeah, you, you, the problem is with DIN, you need to really change it. You, what's that? Yeah. You didn't really change it. You just pushed it down a layer. Yeah, and you, you still need to... Without actually improving the security. Yeah, and you yeah. still need to actually... Vol you still need to cascade volume mounts all the way down and stuff, right? That's the thing with DIND, right? Is that, like, the, at the end of the day, you still need stuff from the host mounted. No, no, what, what I mean is uh, you can split that image facade into two. One is... Uh, the volume mount and all mm -hmm. those things is taken care of by the one piece. Just pulling the pulling is done by the bin container and uh, yeah, yeah. yeah you could do that. As as soon as they work around the whole AUFS thing, being able to run that in an unprivileged way and outside of a container, outside of a you know that not being platform independent, like that would that would solve didn't would solve some yeah. of these problems. Yeah, I run uh, on my laptop. Uh, Instead of mini kube, I, I yeah. run three Docker containers, bin, yeah. and then okay. like form a Kubernetes block dropper. Oh, cool. There's, yeah. there's a lot of ways to solve this problem. Yeah. There's a lot of design to think differently. You could yeah. use Synex Kubernetes. If you're really worried about it, you can simply put another the, cluster off to the side and yeah. just suck everything in that cluster off to the side. Yeah. You can put, you can put process controls underneath it, DNAs yeah. underneath it. You can do all sorts of things to constrain this thing down. Yeah, the, pro the problem is when you make it too hard for people to deploy, they just, it's like any security tool. Right, it's got a balance system. Yeah, I mean, if, if, if somebody is thinking that much about it, then they probably don't need to buy this tool to begin with. <laughs> like, you know, the, the reason for us, the reason Kubernetes is the target is because you've got a Kubernetes cluster. It's got most of the images you care about on it. It's definitely got the ones that are running in production, which are the highest priority ones to scan. So running it there is just one less amount of work, right? This is not a problem that most developers want to solve. Blue scan all the images. We can scan any image. Yeah, let's keep yeah. going. Yeah. Um, no, I mean that's perfect because honestly, that's most of most of what Opsite is. Um, I don't know. Let's see. So yeah, we do Prometheus metrics because scanning can take days to weeks. So it's really great for us to be able to have some kind of high level overview of you know what what our code's doing. I'm sure you guys are all familiar with metrics and how awesome they are. So, um, why can scanning take weeks? Because... Can some metrics, maybe? Help me understand the sure. velocity. Help me understand yeah, the absolutely. scanning velocity, if you want to call it that. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, typical Kubernetes cluster, I don't know. Let's just throw out some numbers. Let's just say it has, like, I don't know, 100 nodes, 100 images per node. So you're talking about 10,000 images. These scans can take maybe 10 minutes to an hour you know, per image. We can do maybe five to 10 at the same time. So let's say we do 10 at the same time and they take an hour each. That, that would be like. So, yeah, it's, so the velocity through the scanner is not as special, but it's fairly intensive. Right, exactly. Right. And that, that really is the something that we're trying to solve. Right? That's, that's a really tough problem for us because right. the scan speed is just too low if you have a large cluster for customers to really be able to see stuff happening very quickly. So, right. you know, like they'll have a scan queue that's like days long or something. Yep. And like Jay was showing the threat modeling, you know, something comes in, it's vulnerable, you find out about it five days later, that's just not acceptable. Well, you got, well it's not the only solution. You've got to have a way to, to scan things before they get in as well. Exactly. As well as scanning when they're in there. Right, right. exactly. So you've got to do both things. So, so little, that's so a great you point. Stuff onto your QBA exactly. in, your, in your complex without scanning it on right. the way in. And you're making a big mistake. Absolutely. So that, that's a really great point. And you can actually throw away the Kubernetes API server um, and perceiver, and you can run all of this stuff. And then where do you get your images from? Like, 
uh, you have some kind of continuous integration. Every time you push code, you build an image, and you yes, scan you it. Right. You got to make exactly. sure you follow it on the way, and you make sure you're watching it. So the scan key is not a big problem right. if you're watching it on the way. Exactly. It's a big problem if you're not watching it on the way. Right. So that's a great point. So there's kind of two different modes that we sort of see as being valuable. One is, what's running in my cluster right now? And the other is, so I'm building a bunch of images. I want to run them in my cluster. Let me scan them before I do that and just find out if it's OK. And I think both are really important use cases when you're trying to Yeah, the, the external admission controller is something we are looking into um, as a way to, to implement this. The problem is, who's going to gate 100 or 1,000 developers on a scanning on scanning everything. It's it's just not it's hard to do, right? Again, that it always winds up being a trade off of how miserable do you want to make people until the point that they're just not going to use your product anymore. Go go ahead. Yeah. So um, so speaking of the, the, the scan throughput. Or yeah. Not so much throughput. Yeah. Um, do, do you I'm guys, trying to grab uh, the metrics. Um, sort of. Do you, do you have to do you scan the entire image, or you, can you scan layer by layer? Oh, that's a great question, too. Right. So, so we've been experimenting I mean, with scanning layer by layer. Right, I imagine there might be some kind of vulnerability which actually wouldn't show up until layers are layered. Uh, but probably most things you would find would be exist in a single layer at a time. So I don't yeah. need to scan. So it's a I great mean, question. If, you, if you do what you were outlining before, every time you have an image, you've got to do the equivalent of a Docker save. You're going to get everything. Right, exactly. And it's going to be duplicated. I mean, you have the yes. image SHAs to dis distinguish. Yeah, so that's, a, you don't that's a great question. And the way that we do it right now is we actually do literally scan the whole image. And just like you're saying, it's incredibly wasteful, right. especially because the bulk of every image, as long as it's not from scratch, is going to be the operating system. So <laughs> we're actually scanning like the biggest part over and over and over. So we have this branch on GitHub. You can check it out. It's called Ophelia. The idea behind Ophelia is exactly what you're suggesting. You scan every layer one time. You never scan the same layer twice. Right. And then when you get a new image, you only have to scan the new layer. I mean, right. Yeah, so, here, the so here's, a, here's Ophelia. So here's exactly what we're talking about. And so we saw, you know, we saw decent speed ups from that. Um, there are some more challenges for us to solve that we didn't quite solve yet, which is when you have a layer that deletes files, you actually want to have some way of you know, not saying, oh, you solve all these vulnerabilities. Another is that customers might possibly want to see which specific layer of vulnerability came from, and we didn't really have the ability to do that. But you know, like overall, that's that's a good idea, and we're working towards that. The, the really cool thing is how small these layers are, right? Yeah, like uh, I'll read these numbers. Okay, six kilobytes, sixty-two megabytes, one kilobyte, forty-one kilobytes. <laughs> yeah, and there there's some. Uh, a lot of images we see out there that are like one, two gigabytes. So, you know, like how much of that is the operating system versus somebody just copying in like a the GoLang binary on top of that is like 20 megabytes. Of so yeah, that's a that's a great point. Yeah. So roughly, was it 50 percent performance? So yeah, th there's an article about this on our wiki. But yeah, that was a really interesting project. Matt Matt actually did all that, got it all working, kind of. Pretty much, it was super interesting. We proved it out, and then we realized there was just a little more research to do, and it wasn't tactical to, to release it yet. But the R and D shows that it would be ridiculously, ridiculously efficient if we implemented it. I mean, saving terabytes of scan data for offsite customers. So we're going to try to look into that eventually. I mean, how many times do you have to scan Alpha? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. If only once Alpine, every once every version, then that's it. Yeah. Once. yeah. If only Alpine was the thing that we were scanning multiple times, we'd actually be okay. <laughs> Alpine's right. like, it doesn't matter. Ten, even so, you get Alpine's like savings. ten megabytes. CentOS is like two hundred. Yeah, you still would only do it once. You'd actually get and more then we're scanning all the things. All yeah. So yeah, it's it's a great point and definitely a huge a huge potential win there if we can go after that one. All right, I'll give you a slide back. That's okay. I don't you think don't I. Know? I mean, you know, I think everybody's kind of got it. Okay. Did you show them a picture of Optimus Prime? Yeah. yeah let's, okay. Right, so this is Optimus Prime. He just got shot in the chest by Megatron. This is Perceptor up here saying, I fear the wounds of Megatron. Yeah, that's kind of important. Uh, Poor guy. So yeah, that's, dude. that's why we call it Perceptor. He kind of sees everything that's going on. Um, all right, yeah. I mean, that's all, I think that's all. Yeah. That's good enough. We're okay. good. Yep. Yeah. Screen metrics. Yeah, let's show them some more metrics. Do we have a, yeah, screen, a screen. Do we have a metrics we can look at right now? You have it running somewhere, right? Can you you can pull go. up that GKE cluster? 
Yeah, you can. If you can, you're in the cluster. If you want to fish around. So okay, yeah, cool. Well, go to this tab here. Yeah, that's in there. So yeah, now we'll pull up the metrics and we'll show you what it looks like. Um, yeah, it's it's real interesting to see the so so every line of code that's even a little bit interesting in Perceptor and in Perceiver and the scanner has metrics, right? Uh, well, actually, we don't have them published uh, for, for the perceivers, but we push them out from Perceptor uh, and from the scanner. And so, like, we have a particular one called the core status gauge that Matt is very proud of, and, and I am too, that we really like. And it basically tells you how many images have been scanned, how many haven't been scanned. And it lets you look at the throughput of your scanning tool. Um, and it also lets you look at the throughput of offsite and maybe even of your registry if your registry is experiencing issues. Um, and so Matt's going to pull those metrics up. Um, this was the big change in offsite 2.0, is it was completely metrics driven. Um, not only just the. Why isn't the web browser finding this? Oh, do HTTP. I did, dude. Can you curl it? Oh, that's interesting. Sometimes some of them aren't up. If that's the only one, then we don't have it. But maybe we could just get it up and running, right? It's running. It's running for yeah. sure? Oh. Yeah, you can curl it. Weird. That's strange. Um, let's try Safari. Oh no. What? It's not working. How come we can curl it, but we can't? Alright, well, this is embarrassing. <laughs> not really. Well, it's fine. We can do it. We can do it, go through the browser. Right? <laughs> we can prove to them that at least we have metrics. Um, <laughs> I wonder why the internet doesn't work here. Oh, I had this problem before. The Synopsys Wi-Fi was blocking me or something like that. Oh yeah. The Synopsys security. No, we can do we can do we can we can do something though. Here we can kubectl proxy it. What's the name of the service? Um Perceptor Master. Yeah, kubectl, yeah. Service, what's the namespace? Perceptor master, dash master. Okay. Then it's this one, it's this metrics. Okay. All right, so I can do kubectl, God, I hope I can remember to do this. Port forward, do you guys port forward? Anyone? And I'm gonna do dash n perceptor master. And then I'm gonna grab the service, Prometheus. Prometheus metrics. Prometheus metrics. To the port. Mm -hmm. the hell? Um, like that, right? Yeah. No, I didn't put the pod name in there. Um, Oh, that's not the pod. That's the pod. I thought you do it against the service. No, no I do it against either the pod. do it or either against the deployment or the pod. Do it directly against the pod. Okay, that'll work. Kubectl get pods dash. Okay. Here we go. Can we do this? Oh, oops, yeah. Do I have to put a slash on it? Do you have to take off? I have to do a pod slash, right? No. No? There is no colon. Oh, you don't? I don't need a colon here? Yeah. I think you have to delete this. The pod name. It's supposed to be there. 
There we go. Now let's go localhost. God, I love port forward. If it worked. Well, it loaded really fast. Big graph. Can't think it's good. All right, well, I'm going to chalk this one down in the synopsis while I fought or something. Oh, wait. Wait, wait, wait. No, that's because I'm doing this inside of a... Okay. I'm not going to give up yet, <laughs> you guys. Yeah, we're going to drive this train to the bottom of the well in the volcano. Perceptor, core. Okay, so Matt, yep. go ahead. Yeah. <clears throat> well, so there's how port forward works. If any of you guys didn't know how it works, other than me. I'm pretty sure I still don't know how it works. Yeah. <laughs> But at least I know sort of that so it's available. It, it NS enters the namespace in a pod and then S SOCAS, whatever so, the contents from that namespace. So oh, no. No, no, don't back, don't back. Jeez. OK, cool. All right, so we have this GKE cluster that we just run a bunch of test stuff in. It's auto scaling. I don't know what, it's like 20, 30 nodes or something. Yeah. And we've had OpsI run in there for about a month just to see if it's stable, see what the performance is like. And. This top line is the number of pods, and you can see that changes over time because we deploy a lot of stuff for testing, like we deploy a bunch of hubs for testing. This line down here is the number of images that we've scanned, mm -hmm. and this line right here is the total number of images. So whenever these lines are far apart, it means we have a lot of images that have not been scanned. And the very far apart at all. Yeah, but we're looking at four weeks, so if we kind of change that time scale a little bit, you can see, so this was July 17th, 1753, July 18th, so like 12, it took us about 12 hours to catch up with the initial 160 images. To be honest, 160 is a pretty small number of images, so you could easily see it taking a lot longer. Then after that, whenever, some, whenever a bunch of pods got spun up with new images, it took us maybe, I don't know, an hour or something like that to kind of catch up. But overall... So then, yeah, this is why you have to pay us for support. <laughs> Open source is a lie. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so then we have metrics about like, you know, the number of violations that we see on our images. Policies. Ooh, that's ugly. Well, do we have policies placed on that hub? Yeah, I put some in. Okay. Yeah, so in Black Ducks Hub, you can put a policy in place, say, like, to decide, make a Boolean decision of whether or not this is in a violation of something that you allow in your data center. So once you put those policies in place, wow, this is pretty. So we have 58 images that have 29 policy violations. We have 39 images with one policy violation. I mean, there's a lot of information here, but, you know, you, you can see how many... If that's changing over time, things are getting better or worse or something like that. If this was a real cluster that we were actually securing, we'd probably, you know, actually be looking at these for ideas of like what images do we need to just it delete? Be, it would look different than that. Right, exactly. Or are there old ones that we we can upgrade, have fewer vulnerabilities, something like that. One of the nice things is you can plug directly into these metrics to make decisions if you want, rather than having to use REST APIs to call you know, we have this tool called the hub that does all the scanning underneath. Um, it's concerned with manual administration of things, and it has these APIs you can use, but aggregating all this stuff is already done for you by Perceptor, so you could literally hook into these metrics. You could also hook into the Perceptor model, which just gives you a splash in JSON of all of your... Can we get... We can, we can just grab it on kubectl. That's probably the easiest way to do it, right? Yeah. So we can, you know... We can. Um, so there's a lot of things that you can do with this, and still at this point, kind of a toolkit more than absolutely like an absolutely finished product where we know every single thing that should and shouldn't be doing. Um, yeah. So just thinking, um, we're talking about efficiency, scan efficiency. Yeah. Um, and I know you made some big improvements around that. I'm thinking, um, if you're scanning it, the hell do I need to scan it for? Why don't I just use your result? Is there any way that you... Your, your images? No. The, all this stuff that's in public repo, or, sorry, public registry, um, that only needs to be scanned once. 
in the entire universe. Yeah. Once. Right. Assuming that the results can be made public in, in, a, in a reliable way. Right. Right? Is that anything that you guys are thinking about? So that's like a really... Figuring out as a service, instead of this as a, a scanning as a service right. by itself, but also integrate with you know a scan database where you guys at Home Central are scanning fucking everything you can find. Well, to some extent, that is what the KV is. Okay. So that is what the hub ultimately does under the hood. But there's optimizations. Right, doing. but then they would be able to optimize the scanning because I, always, yeah. I don't need to scan everything. I only need to scan the layers on top of the stuff that you've already scanned. Yeah. So I, also be I, like I might be wrong, but I think... Unfortunately, like the real answer to that is that that's kind of a business decision. Right, right, right. It's, it's not it's not a technical, you know, technological problem as much as it's a business. Well, the problem. business might not even think about it if engineers never say, "Hey, we can do this too." Oh yeah, right. I mean, you know, and then yeah. it goes the other way around. Business says, "We want this," and engineers go, "What?" <laughs> Right? Yeah, but, yeah. I mean, I'm just curious if that was something that, that was being I, considered, or I even think, business or engineering wise. So I think our knowledge base team is so. So again, there's the hub. That's the integration point for all this. Opside is something that's on the outer ecosystem of the hub for our cloud native customers. And underneath all this, you know, ultimately we have the Black Duck knowledge base. And the Black Duck knowledge base is what aggregates all this stuff. And, you know, um, how they're going to deal with containers and stuff is up to them, really. We don't, we don't, we don't, you know, we, we that there's a, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff that goes into that. And there's a lot of complexity with, how you match things that you know that we don't fully understand, but you're right. I mean, it's definitely like an, the whole idea of knowing what layers are vulnerable in the public Docker Hub is like super low hanging fruit, right? Yeah, yeah. And the, there, the matching stuff is almost free. Yeah, right? because, and Docker Hub. But the the, 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 the fact is, you can get that from Docker Hub anyways, right? Like you right. can you can get from Docker Hub, and they actually use Synopsys products, I think. Um, That's cool. Yeah, I think they use protocol or something. I don't know. They use under oh. under the hood. Docker Hub actually uses Synopsys stuff. I think. Don't quote me, even though I'm on the internet and a million people will hear me say this, but I think they actually do use um, some of our machinery when you go to Docker Hub and look at the vulnerabilities for an image. So some of that stuff is already out there. Right. Um, I just don't know. So this is the model for Perceptor. So you could build your own little mashups against this stuff. It just basically aggregates everything that's relevant to any container in your cluster. Um, and, and this is all just JSON. So you can build your own little apps, which is something we want to encourage people to do eventually. Is You know, you run Perceptor on your cluster, build your own little app that responds in real time to the changes of vulnerability profiles across your cluster. Your own little dashboard for your own little CIO to make them happy. How do you what? Deploy the okay, yeah, so that's uh, that's another thing where we had a ton of fun, and we don't really do things kind of the standard way. Um, we created another container that uses a Kubernetes API to create pod specs and stuff like that programmatically. So it's just another Golang program. Um, that you started before Helm was there? Or, uh, no, we just, decided we just <laughs> thought that it looked like fun, okay. and that it'd be cool, and we'd learn a lot from it, and all those were true. Um, you know, like once it's deployed, we don't really do anything to monitor it. Like, you know, maybe Helm would or something like that. So, you know, possibly we should use Helm. But if you want to learn more about this, we have this repo called Horizon. Um, GitHub.com, Black Hat Software, we have a whole bunch of stuff on there, all open source. There's Horizon, there's Perceptor, there's Protoform. Um, this, this is a little bit more of a rationale there. Yeah, so Horizon is, um, so, so there's, there's kind of two different camps. There's the Helm camp which in my opinion is kind of dying, and then there's the operator camp, right? And the operator camp seems to be what's kind of taking over, which is that, and maybe they'll, maybe they'll converge. Yeah, two different things. Right? Two different One is for uh, packaging, your, uh, uh, whereas uh, operator is for, uh, I thought it is for uh, uh, CRD or above. Uh, so there's, the, yeah, this is a very, this is a very hairy topic because at the same time, theoretically, you're right. Helm can be looked at as a package manager, and operators could be looked at as a you know application manager. There's just a it's very blurry, and uh, the operator ecosystem is evolving uh, kind of in parallel to the Helm ecosystem, and 
all the templatization and parameterization and stuff that goes into a Helm chart is just a totally, the way most people think of a Helm chart is completely, is, is very redundant to what happens when you build an operator, right? Because at the end of the day, when you deploy Helm, you deploy it with the ability to do any action in any namespace, essentially, typically, right? And it's running in Kube system. When you deploy an operator, you deploy it essentially with the exact same capabilities. So if they're orthogonal, why do they have the same capabilities? The reason is because they both are competing for control over managing your application. The only difference is that Helm has a very kind of transparent GitHub YAML packaging model, um, whereas the operator one, it's a little murkier what their story is around it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's yeah. all available in the public uh, repo kind yeah. of repo yeah. Um, yeah, that's the, the yeah, that's kind of one way of doing it is you can have a helm chart that is responsible for deploying an operator. Yeah, so we, we, we use it uh, as a stand like if you know uh Debian package or RPM mm -hmm. package for Linux. Helm is kind of I, I thought it's a packaging tool. Yeah. And you can if it you is. are building a application use a package it as a helm uh, chart. Yeah. Anybody can deploy maybe Kubernetes cluster as well. I think the problem is that Helm has a lot of different meanings to different people. One thing that Helm does is parameter substitution, another thing it does is packaging, and then another thing it does is administration and upgrading of the packages and installation of them. Right? So when you compare Helm with something like, you know, like Yum or something like that, right? Where Helm is a constantly running privileged process in your cluster. Mm -hmm. It really steps on the operator model. And it becomes very strange, clumsy model when you have Helm running, it's managing all your applications, and then you've got operators <laughs> running for your applications. So these things are bound to collide. Yeah. You know, and, and there's also business interests that are opposed. Um, you have different companies that have, like, the company that's behind Helm, as we know. Well, we've got a representative from that company here right now today. I do not speak for the And we, we have a very different company that's, that's, that's very, very, very fiercely behind the operator model. And so those are, those are going to be, I think they're going to be diverging ecosystems, but it's going to be like, you know, oh, you can run Spring and JBoss, and you can run JBoss and Spring, and they don't compete, but everybody knows that they do. Right, just the same way I can run Linux on my Mac, but it doesn't mean they're not, you know. Th so there's going to be, but the po the point of all this is that rather than getting in the caught in the mess of any of that, for us, the thing that's interesting about Kubernetes is you have access because you're running in a cloud native environment. You have access to everything in the Kubernetes API. So our deployment, we don't ship YAML. So rather than shipping YAML, we yeah. ship something that's essentially yeah, uh, an operator uh, without using the operator API. I definitely take a look at many of the things. Uh, it's really interesting. First time I'm seeing you uh, like a chart for Okay, cool, yeah. Yeah, for us, Horizon is a lightweight thing that's like says, you can embed this, and it will allow you to quickly install things um, without needing... The thing about Helm is there are so many other open source projects. Yeah. Like, uh, one is... We definitely use, uh, there is something called Kubi Apps. Yeah. Um, that's a visualizer for all your Helm charts. It's a yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah. pretty much our visualizer is like all you use the Helm, yeah. Helm Prometheus, uh, uh, Elk, and uh, yeah. uh, Kubi, Kubi Dashboard, and all those things. Yeah. yeah. I think Helm is going to be a standard for people to publish stuff. It's just going to, the parameter substitution stuff is going to die, and it owning your cluster is going to be questionable. Yeah. Right. Uh, okay. So yeah, that's Horizon. This is our solution to the problem of Kubernetes deployment. It's very lightweight. You guys should try it out. It's based on a thing out of a start, another competing tool called Koki Short, which comes out of California, um, which is like an Ansible type deployer like this style. So, um, and you embed it into any container, and then your container can essentially install itself. Right. So um, it can do operator stuff without needing any kind of persistent state. But yeah, those are yeah. This is a really interesting space to watch. What's going to happen with Helm and operators and all this stuff? And we still don't know what the de facto for packaging is going to be, right? It's still a big mess, right? Uh, any other questions, you guys? It's getting late. I mean, I can hang out and talk more, but.
Thanks, Russell. All right, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so on your last slide, you said uh, coming in the future, oh, yeah. more scanners. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. yeah I, don't really like I told a couple of people, that was one of the things so, uh, that I, I get this talking about. Yep. Oh, okay. Yeah. Down in the series, I can't really talk about you or somebody. Yeah. Yeah. You know, somebody. And can I get some context? Oh, so, yes. Okay. 